Welcome, everybody, to uh, our 11th episode of Recovery Soapbox. Um, this episode is brought to you by Brighton Recovery Center. Um, if you like what you hear, you can also subscribe to our podcast on various different channels, Google Play, iTunes, and Stitcher being the main ones. Uh, today, we're really excited to uh, bring on our, our next guest to the Recovery Soapbox. Um, our guest today is Michael Herbert. Uh, Michael is an internationally recognized clinician uh, and leader in addiction treatment. He's been in the field for over 25 years now. Uh, he's a seasoned interventionist, a national speaker on addiction. Um, he's, also, uh, he's also taught addiction counseling to various uh, other places internationally. Some of the areas include Egypt, South Africa, Kenya, other places in North, Northern Africa, Bermuda. Um, and Michael's a, uh, he's a family guide for uh, families struggling with loved ones in addiction. So, um, and there are so many other things that Michael does in this field of recovery, uh, but we'll kind of get to those things as we chat. So welcome, Michael. Well, thanks for having me, Jonathan. Okay. It's always good to be in Utah. Yeah, thank you for being here, escaping Hurricane Irma. Yes, exactly. Okay. It's coming right past my house. Sheesh. So. Well, hopefully you find your place intact when you get home. Mm-hmm. That's what I'm hoping. <laughs> All right. Well, um, prayers go out to everybody out in Florida who's hunkering down and uh, is going to brave this storm. Mm-hmm. Um, so, Michael... Let's just jump right into this. Tell us a little bit about you, who you are, uh, maybe some of your history and pieces of your story. Okay. I am Michael Herbert. I am from Connecticut, New Haven, Connecticut. And I'm also a veteran. And you want U.S. Navy, right? I was in the U.S. Navy. I was there for about five years. Okay. Um, and uh, got out after five years, honorable discharge. Nice. Thank you. And um, eventually I got into the field of addiction. And how I got there was through my own recovery. Um, I had found myself using drugs more than normal, getting myself into trouble um, emotionally, spiritually, financially, um, I didn't really have much um, because everything I had went to drugs. It really got to a place where, and this is how crazy it was, that what do I need a bed for? What do I need a TV for? Mm. What do I need new clothes? I don't need anything. I just need to get more crack. Right. And I lived that way for a while. It was so crazy that um, I realized I had a problem, and I had what I would consider back then a good job at the post office. This was back in the 80s. I'm making about uh, $25,000, $30,000 a year at the post office. When I was at the post office, I went to rehab, and the EAP, the employee's assistance person, told me that you know, there's a $500 deductible if you want to go to this rehab. It's a really nice rehab. I think they can help you. And I said, there's no way I'm going to give you $500 for rehab. Find me something for free. And at that point, he sent me to the VA. And the VA had a 90-day program. And I got into this 90-day program. But back in the 80s, they had a policy that we trust our veterans. Hmm. So through that policy... I used drugs the whole 90 days I was there, and they would ask me, well, Michael, have you been using? And I'd say no. And they would trust what I said. So I got through the program, um, didn't get clean and sober for any period of time, um, and it just reinforced my denial. So for two more years, I continued to use, really lost everything, and then I got found myself ready. Right. Um, so I found myself ready. I went to rehab for 30 days. They felt like I needed more. I was insulted that they felt like I needed more because I thought I really got it and I was really excited about it. So they sent me to what they call as a therapeutic community, which was in Connecticut. It was probably the last one in Connecticut, uh, which was a nightmare. Um, There was nobody like me there. I was unique and different and had a lot of problems with the staff and the other people there. 
But every time I decided, screw it, I'm out of here, I'm leaving, I'd get to the door and I'd say to myself, well, Michael, where are you going to go? Yeah. And there really was nowhere else to go. So I'd march myself back in, do what they tell me to do. And when I think about that program now, I say to myself, that program didn't offer me anything but what I needed. And what I needed was humility. Yeah. And I had no humility back then. And that place really did uh, help me with humility, help me to settle down, gave me an opportunity to look at myself and look at my attitudes. And from there, I moved on. The original 30-day program that I went to happened to send out a letter to their alumni if anybody wanted to be a part of an internship program. So they had a 13-month internship program. And I applied for it. It was exactly what I had two years. I applied for it. They accepted me in. Mm -hmm. And it was a a nine-hour-a-day internship. So it was two hours on the unit and then seven hours a day. No, it was two hours education and six hours on the unit. So it was an experiential internship and we did that for 13 months and then after the 13 months I left the internship got my first job and then six months after that I got certified as an alcoholism counselor in the state of New York. So uh, during the internship what are you guys doing on unit there? So we're learning what it is to be a counselor. Ah. So we're sitting in on groups and eventually we got to facilitate groups. We had education that talked about alcoholism, addiction, group therapy, different modes of therapy, different types of addiction, um, and really gave us, basically gave us 500 hours of education. So we got 500 hours of education, so we were able to sit for the exam. And then we had to get 2,500 hours of work experience. So while I was doing my internship, I took on 20 hours a week extra to work on the adolescent unit so I could start to build my uh, work hours to set for the test. So I rented a room in Albany, New York, or Albany area, actually Schenectady, New York, Mm -hmm. and um, I did the internship and then I worked on the adolescent unit. I was able to afford my rent and my food, and I did all of this on my own with the help of Yale University and some churches where I wrote a letter and I talked about what I was going to do and I needed basically some money to live. So there were people who made donations to me and I went through that 13-month internship and was able to just work part-time and be able to afford uh, to live and, and get through. And then eventually I moved to New York City and got my first job. And my first job was actually in a therapeutic community. Wow. Yeah. So, okay, so you you go through the process of the addiction and then the process of recovery and you get called back in through alumni services on, you know, to to get into, basically to get into the field as a counselor. Was there a moment in there where you were, were, you know, you realized, yeah, I mean, this is exactly what I want to do? Well, I think I knew what I wanted to do way before I started doing it. Because when I was in junior high school and high school, Mm -hmm. the only thing that I wanted to do, the coolest job I thought, was the guidance counselor. And boy, I wanted to be a guidance counselor. And so once I got into recovery and saw the staff in what they did, I liked what they did. And for me, that was like a guidance counselor. Sure. So that's how I got into the field. And I believe, I don't know if this is all in my mind, that I'm really good at it and I'm a natural at it. So it was, on some level, it was easy for me to do this work, although the difficulty was learning to do it naturally. And initially I felt like I was on stage or on camera Mm -hmm. and it was difficult for me to have natural conversations with people, especially when I was being monitored by a supervisor or being filmed to look at your technique. But over time, I was able to figure out my own groove and what worked for me and created my own style. That's awesome. I I think that, you know, your comment about um, 
you know, thinking that you're good at it. I don't think that anybody lasts in this field if they're not. It seems to me like one of the fields that you work in and really you could get eaten alive. By... You can get eaten alive. And there's a lot of people in the field who are misplaced. Yeah, that's true um, too. Not through any fault of their own. They're just kind of misplaced. And they may stay in it longer than they really need to. Yeah. Uh, but eventually you find out because you have to get to the point where people respect you. Right. And respond to you. And if people aren't responding and respecting you and you haven't been able to develop the relationships, it's not going to be fulfilling for you. Right. And for me, it really is about developing those relationships. Yes. And the relationships that I have with clients and the family is long term. So I have people that I am still in touch with from the 1990s that I worked with. Yeah, it's not every week or every month, but we have regular contact. They call me, I contact them, and we just continue on with the relationship. Right. Yeah. And some of these people you work with from way back when are doing well. They're having their kids They're now. doing well. I have hundreds of people who have gone on to get bachelor's and master's degrees and married and live successful lives Yeah, and are in recovery long term. I just came from a wedding from somebody I worked with 22 years ago. In the, it was just a great experience. Wow. Yeah. I mean, what is that conversation like? Hey, Michael, come to the wedding. Remember me? Oh. <laughs> well, he invited me to the wedding. Right. And um, he literally cried at the wedding. Oh. When he introduced me wow. as a person that saw something in him that he didn't see in himself. It really was a touching moment. Wow. It was great. Yeah. That's why we do this. Yeah. Okay. And I wound up getting a dog out of it. That's so. right. <laughs> From the Dominican Republic. Yeah. He gave me a dog, uh, Shiba Inu. Yeah. yeah. Does that dog understand English? Well, he understands no. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think it's the same. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. <clears throat> so... You talked a little bit about how um, this led to your professional career. Uh, can you talk a little bit more about what you've done in the field once you've been once you've gotten certified, uh, different positions that you've held? Because I know that you've worked in this in this industry for a long time, and you've done lots of different jobs at different treatment centers and things mm -hmm. like that. Can you give us an overview of your trajectory through the field? Well, my first job was actually at a therapeutic community. Actually, my first job was a volunteer job. Right. And I did volunteer work initially because I really felt like I needed to give back. Um, and then I got a job at a therapeutic community uh, in New York called Samaritan Village. And I worked with them for a year. And it just gave me some perspective on the other side of being in a therapeutic community. I was at one as a client. Mm -hmm. Now I got to be one as a staff. And those clients there gave me as hard of a time as I gave the staff when yes, I was they there. they did. So, That's what they did. So they gave it right back to me. <clears throat> and eventually I moved on to an intensive outpatient program, which I really loved. So I did intensive outpatient for the first seven years after the therapeutic community. And I worked with these two guys, Bob Smith and Vince Casalero, who were big time in intervention in New York. Mm -hmm. And they slow me, slowly taught me uh, intervention. And they talked about the process of getting families into recovery versus the idea of just getting the addict into recovery. Right. So I got that concept in the 90s about bringing the family into recovery and not just the addict. So if mom needs therapy, counseling, self-help, we get her that too. And we're not going to just focus on the addict because we realize and we start to know that everybody in the family is part of the problem and everybody in the family is a part of the solution. Right. And we can't just treat the addict without treating the family also. It's unfair to the addict. And if we're going to bring families together, we have to get everybody on the same page. A family systems concept, concept right? Mm -hmm. Where you know, one piece of the system is not functioning correctly per se. And during uh, many a long period of time of that system not functioning correctly, that many of the pieces of that system have become ineffective, right? Mm -hmm. So when you when you take one one piece out, say the patient, bring them to treatment, the family still needs to know what to do, how to handle the situation. Absolutely. Because then you bring the person back in and nothing has changed, then mm -hmm. nothing has changed. Right. And so even when we talk about family, 
we have a tendency to talk about the family and the addict. I try to talk about the family because the addict is a part of the family and I'm not going to separate him from the family or her from the family. Right. It's the family problem. So even psychologically, when we talk about the family and then talk about the addict, we're creating a separation. Mm -hmm. And the families are affected the very same way the addict is affected by his drug use. Right. So there's headaches, there's stress, there's money problems, there's financial problems, sexual problems. All of these things the addict experiences, the family experiences, and substance abuse. Yeah. I just talked to a family, and we listed all the similarities for the family and the addict. And then I said, and then the mom starts to take pills. And she said, that's right, Xanax. And she just listed all of the pills she was taking. Right. I said, we got to get you some help. Oh, no, I don't need any help, mom says. I said, yes, you do. And so my job is to help the whole family. Right. We're not going to just focus on your loved one, that you're going to be a part of this process. Okay. It's a great segue into, um, well, I did want to talk a little bit about your experience as an interventionist, but let's talk about the family. Um, mm -hmm. You know, you do a lot of family coaching, like you were just mm -hmm. talking about. It sounds like a coaching scenario. But you also work uh, within a program for, for uh, treating families while mm -hmm. somebody is in treatment and then thereafter. Mm -hmm. Or maybe even before. Or maybe even without the, the afflicted as part of the situation. You listed all of what I do. Okay. I work with families when the addict is involved, when they're in treatment, when they're not in treatment when the addict or alcoholic isn't involved, and I provide structured family recovery counseling okay. for the family, which focuses on each individual being a part of the process. So mom focuses on mom, dad focuses on dad, sister focuses on sister, brother on brother, addict on addict, grandparents on grandparents. Right. And everyone begins to speak the same language. So if you have a family program and you have an addiction program, and you tell people you need to work your own program, oftentimes that means the family does one thing and the addict does something else, right. but they don't come together on it. If we bring them, to, I mean, we're, we're telling them they can have Thanksgiving dinner together, but nobody talks about recovery together. Right. So structured family recovery gets families to talk about recovery together, and everybody's on the same page and in a process. Okay. So they do steps, just like the addict does steps and sponsorship and supports and meetings and things like that. Yeah. Sometimes with families, there's a little more work you put into helping them understand how they have been affected. And I like to use the term, instead of using terms like codependency, I like to use the term of secondhand drinking and drugging. Huh. That's what they experience, just like a secondhand smoker experiences some of the negative effects of cigarette smoking. Right. So families experience what we call secondhand drinking and drugging. Okay. Mm -hmm. And so you're a certified um, structured family counselor. Recovery counselor. Okay. I'm a certified intervention professional and a certified addiction counselor. And I'm also a recovery coach. And recovery coach for me means two different things. Okay. Sometimes I'm a recovery coach for people who don't like the word therapist or counselor. So I call myself a recovery coach to help get them into recovery or treatment or get their needs met. But if I'm truly doing what I believe recovery coaching, that's for people who are already in recovery, are motivated to get better, but are feeling stuck. Yeah. So I work with them on their stuck points. My job as a recovery coach in the truer sense isn't to motivate someone to be in recovery. I'm working with people who are already motivated. Yeah. And, and and help them along to get or achieve the goal that they're looking to achieve. And is this recovery coaching also post-treatment? You help people that way? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Uh, uh, some, uh, some, A lot of caveats. Just, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh-huh. Okay. So before treatment, somebody says they want to coach. Well, I'm not going to really coach someone in the true sense of coaching who's shooting dope or smoking crack. I'm going to be a director 
and get them some help of what they need. Mm -hmm. If I can't do it in two or three sessions, I'm not going to continue to work with the person because it's not good for them. And it certainly wouldn't be good for me to say that I'm treating someone knowing they're shooting dope or drinking a quart of vodka a day. Right. You know, so my, my, my job for that particular person is get them the help that they need. And sitting with me is not the help that they need. They need to be detoxed and medically managed. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, um, did you want to say anything else about, um, the structured family recovery in terms of where it comes from, what the program is? Who well, it was designed by a Deborah J. And uh, a couple of years ago, I took a training, a week long training, and got certified in structured family recovery. Prior to that, I worked at an agency for about 14 years. And what we did was we worked with families weekly. Mm -hmm. So the client is in treatment. And I called the family weekly. And my focus was with the family was to focus on what they were doing. That phone call was not about me talking about what the client is doing. Right. It's what are you doing for your recovery? Are you you're doing your meetings? You're going to your therapy? Are you addressing your issues? And working with them on stopping the enabling of the disease of addiction and help them to enable the recovery process. Yeah. Process. So that's what I helped families with. And I did that for 14 years. So it was a great setup for me to move into structured family recovery. Right. Because structured family recovery is about getting the family into recovery. So I had a foundation for that. But the difference, I think, with structured family recovery and what I did as a therapist is I'm not pro providing counseling therapy or coaching in structured family recovery, what I am doing is facilitating a process. Right. So I will appropriately use self-disclosure. I will comment on certain areas of the process to help them along with it. I don't tell them what to do, although there are guidelines in structured family recovery that everyone has to follow a basic guideline. Mm -hmm. And that is that they're willing to attend at least one self-help meeting a week, that they're willing to participate in the phone call once a week, and they read the book. And so we try to keep it simple. We don't want it complicated. It's done using conference calls mm -hmm. so people can call in anywhere around the country <clears throat> it's more simple than a computer because everybody has a phone right so it makes it really easy and it's been very rewarding for me as it has been for families right. that they really love that process i work with some families where the addict isn't even a part of the call and my sense of that particular family is they don't want the addict on the call right that they want to do this thing together they've got healing to do yeah yeah you know and i've worked with uh, one family, the mother, the father were in New York, the sister was overseas, the grandparents were in Colorado, and the son was in uh, Arizona, and they all called into the uh, conference line. Nice. And I worked with them for 48 weeks, wow. and they're doing great. The son, who's an addict, actually now works in the field of addiction. Right. So he's doing good, and the family's doing good. And I utilize those families to be mentors and supports for other family. So any family that I get in structured family recovery, I assign them to another family who's gone through the process to give them some support. Excellent. Mm -hmm. Seems like such a valuable program. And if I could just put a plug in there for Deborah J, the book is called It Takes a Family. It Takes a Family. Right. So yep. if anybody, any of our listeners wants to peek into that, you can order it off of Amazon. Um, it's a great read. I've read it myself and, um, and we'll have contact info for Michael listed at the end of the podcast. Mm -hmm. So, um, if you're looking for help in that department, I'd, I'd highly suggest it, especially for the family. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. okay. Um, back to your intervention days, if you mm -hmm. don't mind. I mean, the concept of interventions really fascinates me. Mm -hmm. You are a person and you put yourself in somebody else's immediate environment Right. And you have no idea what you're walking into when you are all set to do this intervention with the addict. Right. Mm -hmm. And or the alcoholic. And, and they walk in the house and you're there. And in my mind, you know, I think, you know, the Hollywood scenes. Right. So mm -hmm. you, in my mind, you are directly in harm's way. And really anything can happen in that moment. Mm -hmm. uh, this person can walk in with a loaded firearm um, or nothing can happen. But mm -hmm. uh, can you give us I mean, what is. What's your experience with doing interventions and how do they usually go? 
Well, what I try to do is prepare myself and get enough information first because I don't want somebody coming in with a firearm. Yeah. So I usually will not do an intervention in somebody's home ah, because okay. they're in their environment and I don't want to get myself in trouble in their environment. So I try to bring it to a neutral location. Usually that works. Um, what, like a park? or uh, No, we don't go to a like? park, although I did intervene on somebody in a park because they ran oh. and I had chased them down the street. <laughs> okay. and we met in the park and the parents came to the park and we did the intervention letters there. And eventually he went to treatment and I just got a phone call from him last week and he celebrated five years. Wow. And he was, I could hear him crying over the phone yeah. uh, in gratitude for what he had accomplished. He had a terrible relationship with his mother and presented as if she, he hated her. And now they're close and it's just a really loving relationship and it's just touching. Yeah. You know, and I get to talk to him and the mother every once in a while and they tell me about their progress. And the mother is one of the women who's willing to work with other mothers and help them out in the process also. Okay, great. Yeah. So successful intervention. Successful intervention. I've done an, a one-on-one -on -one intervention. I had to fly overseas to intervene on uh, this particular woman and, you know, challenge her. And I brought her to my hotel lobby. Okay. And we addressed the problem. I basically told her that I'm going to be where I was going to be. And if you were interested in what I had to say, you need to show up. And I guess she was interested because she had known that I was talking with her family. Mm -hmm. Her family wouldn't come. We were in the British Virgin Islands okay. and the family wouldn't come for whatever reason. So I said, I'll take a stab at it and try to help her out. Uh, eventually she showed up and we had a discussion. She gave me her list of demands that needed to happen first. Mm -hmm. And we whittled them down to just a couple of things that I was willing to support. And then she eventually went to treatment. As a matter of fact, she was referred to Brighton Recovery Center, right. and she's doing really well now. I think she has a couple of years. Okay. So I've done a lot of different interventions with a lot of different people in a lot of um, different scenarios. Intervention for me is probably tougher mm -hmm. than any other work that I do because I get anxious around the thought of doing it. And it always seems harder when the family gives you the history yeah. than it is when you actually get there with the family. Yeah. Not every intervention works in the sense that after you've intervened on the person, they go to treatment. Sometimes treatment for that person happens a month later or nine months later. And I've intervened with people, worked with the family, help them to maintain their boundaries over a nine month period. And that nine months of connection with the family, maintaining the boundaries is what got the person to go into treatment yes. because they had nowhere else to, else to go. Sometimes people bottom out eventually and just throw in the towel. Okay, I'll do what you say, right. but they're not always willing to do it right away. So they have to find their own process. I believe the best intervention happens when the person gets to a place where they want to go to treatment versus have to go to treatment. Yeah. There's plenty of people that have to go. Yeah. But the ones who want to go and want to be there and want to be in recovery are the ones that stay there. Yeah. That's my experience yeah. too. Mm -hmm. And I think that, again, back to working with the family, if you're working with the family and teaching them how to you know, create the boundaries and then stick to the boundaries that they've created, um, you are effectively driving, it, what it feels like to the family at the time is that you're effectively driving the, a wedge between the family and their loved one. But what you're really doing is driving that person towards treatment. Driving them, and I'm bringing them closer yeah. to their loved one because what drives the wedge is the addiction, is the drugs. That's exactly right. It's not Michael Herbert. Yeah. It's the addiction. Right. And so how do we bring families together? Sometimes you have to give up something to get something. Mm -hmm. So if we can give up the drug use, family members can give up the enabling, we can bring people together. Yes. Um, wow. I mean, it's fascinating work. I think that, you know, a life like yours has, is just 
it's such an inspiration to so many people. But you know, I got to tell you, a lot of people look at a life like mine and say it's great. You know, personally, it's sometimes it's a struggle. Yeah. Because here I am helping people. And I have my own stuff to work on. Yeah. You know, and I, I remember early on in recovery, when I was working in the field, I go to meetings. And it was hard for me to go to meetings and be open and honest because I had clients that may or may not be in the meeting. And I was also worried that if I say something, mm-hmm. it'll get out there of something that I'm working on. So it was a dilemma for me. So I hear a lot of people say, oh, when I work in the field, it keeps it green. Yeah. I think for me, working in the field was a challenge for my recovery. Right. Because I had to do this work with people and also be in recovery. And I can sit in a session with somebody as they're in their denial telling about their drug use. I'm saying to myself, boy, that sounds good. I wish I could do that. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm thinking, my, and I got to catch myself sometimes, yeah. <laughs> and Michael, that never works. And yeah. you used to think that way too. Right. So good therapy has also helped me in my recovery in working with the fe- in the field and good supervision. To avoid making your work your recovery. Right. And for burning out. Yeah. Because you can get into a cycle of overhelping. And wanting to save and help everyone and feeling responsible for other people's recovery. And I'm not responsible for anybody's recovery. Yeah. They're responsible for their life and their recovery. I just am facilitating a process with a hope that they'll get better. At the end of the day, I do. I want everybody to get better. But I know the truth is some won't and some will and some will later. Yeah. Yeah. And some won't later. Yeah. And some won't later because... There's plenty in the graveyard yeah. that had to go through their process. And I don't fault them. They they did what they did. Some people just miscalculate and did too much this one time and it's over. Right. Well, what a good segue. You're not responsible for other people's recovery. You're responsible for your own recovery. Absolutely. And so, I mean, I read on your website... Uh, a blog, one of your blog posts, the most recent one about mm-hmm. going to Peru. Yeah. I and mean, you went to Peru and you are faced with this kind of moral recovery dilemma. Mm-hmm. Uh, tell us about that and your thought process leading up to that. Well, I went to Peru. I wanted to go to Machu Picchu. Mm-hmm. And um, I went with a group of people. But prior to going, I would tell people that this is my plan. And I talked to other people, and they had tried uh, Machu Picchu and have gone there before and said it was a great trip. And I don't want to get anybody in trouble, but I was talking to somebody about it, and they told me that they had done um, coca leaves. And I said, oh. Why? I mean, They said it helped them to deal with altitude sickness. Okay. But I said to myself, it's a stimulant. And if I take a stimulant like coca leaves, it would be a relapse for me. Right. So I said that I wasn't going to do it. So I wound up going to Peru with a few people. And throughout the whole trip, everyone was recommending that I do the coca leaves because I was experiencing altitude sickness. Right. And I thought about it. You know, several times, well, maybe I should do it. It'll relieve the headaches, this, that, and the other. Um, And I would get messages from people on Facebook who were in recovery that said, Michael, just do the altitude. Don't be a hero. Don't. And I said, I couldn't get over the fact that I thought it was a relapse. Right. But I did say to myself, well, maybe I'll sneak some coca tea in do that and then when i get home if somebody asks me i'll just lie about it right you know i'm not you know i've lied in the past but i just couldn't do it so what i decided to do was why don't i go to the hospital and say what they say (laughs) yeah well the, the the doctor at the hospital said we need to get you on oxygen because altitude sickness i got headaches i couldn't sleep at night and a stimulant wasn't going to help me 
what that was going to do is get my heart racing more and cause me even more trouble. Yeah. Because I couldn't go 20 feet without being out of breath. So imagine with a stimulant how I'm going to feel. I'm going to have a heart attack. Right. So the doctor said that is not really true what they say about coca leaves. And I'm also American. And it's not a part of my culture to climb mountains on coca, coca leaves. Right. It's a part of the culture in Peru. And I'm not going to mess around with adding something from their culture into my life and cause me to relapse. My fear was, and I thought this thing through, if I do coca leaves, I might decide, well, I've done some coca leaves. I might as well smoke some weed. Right. I smoke some weed. Hmm. I might as well smoke some crack, at least just for the weekend. Right. And I'm in big trouble. Yes. Now I'm going to lose my job. I'm going to lose all the money in my bank account. I'm going to lose respect of others. And I'm going to have to lie and cheat and steal and move back to hopelessness. And I'm not sure if I ever picked up again, if I would ever get back into recovery. I'll always be able to pick up again. Yeah. But I don't know if there's another recovery available for me if I do. Hmm. So I just stay away from it. You know, there's a million and one things I can do in life. Eh, do I have to smoke weed, even if it's legal? Do I have to drink? Do I have to do other drugs? No, I can leave that stuff alone and do something else. Right. So what I try to do with my time is I travel around the world. I've been to 38 different countries wow. since I've been in recovery. Right? I've taken on challenges living in the uh, desert of Utah, doing a primitive living course. I've lived with the Terra Mahara Indians in the mountains of Mexico. I ran a 155-mile race through the Sahara Desert. You know, So there's a lot of things that I can do in life that I never would have even thought of until I got in recovery. Right. And so I try, try to provide hope for other people that there's so many things that you can do. Once you get into recovery, it's beyond your wildest dreams what you could. You, going into recovery, you would have never imagined the things that you could do in recovery. Yeah. I'm also a CrossFit enthusiast. Yeah. So, you know, I'm like 60 years old and I go to CrossFit four and five days a week. You know, I try to keep up with the young people, yeah. <laughs> you know, but I don't go too hard because I don't want to get hurt. Right. Because once you slip and fall, you're going to have trouble for a long time. So I try to do it safely and I've done pretty good. Great. Yeah. Okay. To end the story of after getting O2 in mm -hmm. Peru, you did that resolve? The, well, the it sickness? didn't resolve it. Okay. What it did was it gave me some relief. So the headache was gone. I was able to get through the day without being breathless. Okay. So it was tolerable. Will I ever go in altitude like that again? Probably not. I'm going to stay at low altitude <laughs> and do things that I know that I can do. I can tolerate the heat, but I can't tolerate the, uh, the altitude. So I go to hot places now. You know you're sitting at about 5,000 feet right now. It's not quite as high as 12,000. Oh, wow. So we can get up to about 7,000 and be okay. Yeah. But anytime we move past that. It gets pretty thin up there. It gets thin okay. and I'm in trouble. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So. All right. <clears throat> um, all right. Something you, you call barbershop wisdom. I would love that analogy. I read it on your site. Uh, I think it's very cool. I, if you would just explain it for us. Uh, well, you know, oftentimes you hear people say, um, don't go to the barbershop unless you're willing to get it or ready for a haircut. And it's always presented in a negative way. Mm -hmm. And that barbershop is always the relapse. But I like to look at the barbershop as recovery. So if we go into the barbershop in meetings, therapy, counseling, 12-step retreats, we're going to get a haircut and the haircut might be recovery. Right. So I think a lot of times in recovery uh, communities and counseling, there's a lot of negative that we look at and we don't look at the positive. So I try to turn things around. That's why I try not to use terms like uh, enabling. 
I mean, not enabling. Codependency. Codependency. Yeah. You know, because I don't want to label people as a... Some people are insulted with that title. So I think secondhand drinking and drugging is probably a better way to explain what happens to others than giving them the label of uh, codependency. Right. Yeah. Okay. That's great. So in instead of if you go to the bar, you're going to drink philosophy, you mm-hmm. turn that around and say, if you get to treatment, you're going to get treatment. You're going to get, absolutely. Right. You're going to get treatment. You're going to get recovery or you're going to get the message. Yeah. Sometimes that message uh, doesn't sink in that first time, but it's there and it might work the second or the third time. I don't think giving up on people um, is the way to go. I used to smoke cigarettes, and it probably took me five times of trying to quit before it stuck, Right. but eventually it stuck. So if somebody happens to have to go to treatment three or four times, so be it. Yeah. What treatment does is it saves lives. And it, what I like to think is if that person didn't go to treatment that particular time, that person could have been dead. Yeah. Now, if they went to treatment and used again, at least they got another shot at recovery. Yeah. So um, I think it's unreasonable at times if you've been using drugs and alcohol for a long period of time, that treatment will work magically the first time. Yeah. Right? I also believe in this. I believe what works best for people is long-term treatment. And they're engaged in a process long-term. That number 28, it's I don't... arbitrary. Yeah, it's arbitrary. I think it came from the military as the, uh, the leave time that they would give soldiers. Oh. 28 days is for the highly motivated person that on some level got everything else together. And it doesn't work for them usually. But we have a younger population that needs more yeah. because they come from sometimes family systems where the boundaries are limited or way too flexible. Mm-hmm. They need firm and consistent kind of direction in order to get into recovery, along with love and support and nurturing. Yeah. You know, their self-esteems are shot and shame has taken over. And if we're not working with people on their shame and their fears, they're probably not going to get better and they won't get better for the long term. Right. Yeah. And you factor in basic life skills with that. I mean, these addictions are happening at such a young age. You know, some of these people coming through treatment don't even they don't know how to fill out a job application. Mm -hmm. They don't know how to use public transportation. They don't even really know how to make a phone call to their you know, credit card, or if they even have one, they mm-hmm. would. So all these kinds of skills would uh, be part of that process of longer term treatments, right? Once they're able to function, absolutely. And yeah, these these young people are really lacking. Mm-hmm. And I hate to say these young people because yeah. that's what my grandmother used to say. Yeah. And now I guess I'm an old person, so I'm using that term. Uh, I feel like uh, old. <laughs> <laughs> when I say young, the young people today. Yeah. These whippersnappers? Yeah. Uh-huh. <laughs> but, I mean, these people that are younger than you. So mm-hmm. the younger, the emerging population, the millennials and mm-hmm. younger are coming in and, you know. But they this... have a difficulty with a work ethic, consistency, um, tend to want things easy. They lack or struggle with independence or interdependence. We're talking about a group of people that is overly dependent on somebody else making up for the areas in their life that they struggle with. Mm -hmm. And we have to help people with those areas, those gaps in their lives, so they can feel competent and be able to move forward in life without having to fall back and overly rely on somebody. But if they can learn a give and take, a good deal is a good deal for both. Mm -hmm they're going to probably get better. And the conversation of how we got that way is one for another day because that's a whole other complex. Uh Well, I got to tell you, my mother, at the end of my addiction, she said, Michael, I will bring you a sandwich 
and meet me at the corner and I'll bring you a sandwich. But that's it. Mm -hmm. Unless you're willing to get help, I can't help you. No money, nothing. No money, no nothing. So she gave me the sandwich. And a hug. She didn't give me a hug. Not even a hug. She uh, drove by and gave me the sandwich out of the window. (laughs) It was a uh, drive-by. Two weeks later, I said, Mom, I'm willing to get help. Can I spend the night at your house? She said, you can spend the night at my house for one night. And somebody better pick you up in the morning and take you to rehab. And I made arrangements to get into rehab. They picked me up that morning. And um, I got into rehab. And that was 28 years ago. Wow. I have a great relationship with my mother. Um, I'm able to give back and do all of the things that a loving son should do with their, with their loved ones. Mm-hmm. I uh, have a good relationship, I think, with my uncles. I mean, my nephews and my brothers. I have good relationships with people in the community. Um, it's it's an ongoing process of you know kind of taking a look at myself and working at the areas that I need to work in, but it seems to be working out. And so, you did some work in Egypt. Actually, I moved to Egypt. <clears throat> um, it was in two thousand five, and I had always wanted to live out of the country, mm-hmm. and I just couldn't figure out a way to do it. And I had met some people in Egypt that said that there was some need in Egypt. And would I be willing to uh, come out there, take a look around, and see what was available? Um, so I did take a vacation out there and uh, into Cairo. And I thought it was something I could do. How, does that, how do you bridge a language barrier? I mean, how, how do you do that? Well, I spoke English. And I worked with people who spoke English. Okay. Um, I took some <laughs> Arabic lessons, you know, um, but I, I didn't speak Arabic. Okay. So most of the people that I worked with were English-speaking Egyptians and Middle Easterners and then also expats from other, other countries that happened to be in Egypt. Okay. Um, so I packed up my things, sold my house, sold my car. I gave my dogs to someone. Wow. And I moved to Egypt. It was quite an adjustment, you know, culturally. Initially, I thought this should be easy. I'm an American. I'm flexible. I can fit in anywhere. But I realized it was, I went to another world, another way of thinking, another way of doing things. Part of that time, I was trying to force my will Mm -hmm. to make things work for me until I decided to surrender and kind of go with the flow. But what I learned in Egypt is addiction affects people in Egypt just like it does in the United States. Sure. The problems and the successes are there also. I really enjoyed being there because recovery in Egypt when I was there was an, a, big, a concept that was new. So most of the people were beginners, so to speak. And I think I had 16 years when I went there. Right. So I was one of the old timers, so to speak. Mm -hmm. So I got a lot of accolades for that. And that made me feel good that, you know, people looked up to me. Um, But their denial is as strong as the denial here. Uh, One of the things that I noticed was after people got some time in the program, like a year, they would drift off and start drinking. Um, So there was big gaps in periods of time. There were a couple of people that had the same amount of time as I did, but they were few and far between. And what I really realized was that there were just a lot of people that after a year decided to use again. Right. Um, But over time, I've stayed in touch with people. The recovery rates there are are probably as high as they are in the United States. They don't have the luxury of treatment the way we do here, Mm -hmm. um, but they do have some treatment. And treatment is coming along there. So people are getting better. So I stayed there for a little over over a year and then came back to the United States. Wow. Yeah, but it was a great, um, it was a great adventure for me. I met a lot of people and I like to think I helped a lot of people, but I was also helped by a lot of people there. Yeah. So um, it was through the kindness of others that I was able to stay there for as long as I, as, as I did. Right. Yeah. And, and during that time, is that when you ran the 115 miles? No, 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 no. That I was a young man then. 
Oh. I didn't do the 155 miles until I was 52. 155? Yeah, 155 miles. Holy cow. And so that's 155 miles with all my equipment on the, my back. So it was a marathon a day for four days and then 58 miles on the fifth day that bled into the sixth day. I was the fourth slowest, but 170 started, 117 completed. And my claim to fame was I beat the youngest guy who was 19. He was from Korea. So <laughs> at my age, I beat him. Awesome. But I was also able to raise in that period of time almost $100,000 in, in scholarship funds for people. Okay. So um, my run was an adventure for me. It was a physical challenge for me. But I was also able to help other people get into recovery. Okay. And that's really what it's all about, helping others. Yeah. Great. Mm -hmm. That's such a cool story. Yeah. Um, okay. There's a picture of you on the website, and you're shaking uh, our former President Obama's hand. How did how did that happen? Where were where were you then? And just tell us about that story. Um, this was probably about four years ago, and like I said before, recovery goes beyond your wildest dreams. Who would ever think I would meet the President of the United States? Yeah. And ever think that I would get to talk to him. And I knew someone who was a political donor who asked me, Michael, would you be interested in meeting the president? Mm -hmm. You know, just kind of out of the blue. Right. I said, sure. Well, I have, we're going to this event that, um, a political event in uh, Hollywood, Florida, or Hallandale, Florida. And if you'd like to go, you can go. And so I got this ticket to go to this, this event. And uh, we met with the president for about 30 minutes. He spoke on some things. And then everybody who was in the event, there was probably 30 of us mm -hmm. in this room with the president, got an opportunity to meet with him, speak with him, shake his hand, and take a few pictures. I mean, it was the thrill of my life. Wow. The other thing that me and uh, the president had in common is we were exactly the same height. Really? Yeah, exactly the same height. So if you look at my picture, you'll see myself and the president as exactly the same height. Okay. And so what did you guys talk about? I talked about the running. Okay. I talked about smoke cessation and quitting smoking um, and then helping others and what I had done. I was talking so much that he had to remind me. He said, Michael. We got to look at the camera so we can take some pictures. <laughs> so uh, we did that, uh, cut it short, and yeah. and I moved on. But it was really it was a thrill of a lifetime. Wow! Yeah, that's amazing. Yeah, and since that, I, before that, and after that, I had worked with a lot of, I don't know, high end celebrities and and things like that, which was a real thrill for a while. But their problems are just as big or as small as everybody else's. Yeah. And I think I treat people equally. They need as much help as people who have less. And I try to give back wherever I can to whoever is open to it and some of those who aren't open to it. Okay. So it's been, for me, it's just been a great career that I've been able to work in detoxes, intervention, aftercare, inpatient, therapeutic communities, outpatient, Family. with the very wealthy, the very poor. Um, I've volunteered my time. I've worked with families. I think I've worked with over 15,000 individuals and families in my career. Wow. Um, so I like to think I've put a small dent in this addiction and have created some real recovery. So every person that you work with that's successful or even not successful does carry a message. Mm -hmm. And my hope is that the message of recovery works. Sometimes it doesn't work right away. But if you put in the effort and you work at it long enough, it'll eventually work. Right. There is no really unfortunate who can't make it. I believe everybody can make it. Everybody doesn't make it. But everybody has the opportunity and the possibility of getting into recovery and staying there. Right. And helping others in the process. 
I love it. I think that's why we get along so well, have the yeah. same philosophy. Mm-hmm. It's never a wasted treatment episode. It's never wasted a, a, a wasted attempt to get somebody in treatment. Always something is happening. Always. And, and if, you, you know, if the particular addict doesn't, you help mom. Yeah. You help the brother. You help the sister. You help the neighbor. Mm-hmm. You help the friend. What's your overall message? Is it of hope? Is it? Uh, it's a, it really is. A, it's a message of hope. And that people can get better over time. You got to put some effort into it. And sometimes we get exhausted with some of the work that we do. Then take a break. Don't pick up during the break. Yeah. And then pick it up tomorrow. And do the work that you need to do tomorrow. And eventually you'll get better and you'll be able to see the progress. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Well, Michael... Uh, how can people get in touch with you if they have questions, if they want to reach you offline here? If you want to reach me, yeah. you can reach me at recoveryguide.net. You can email me at recoveryguide at gmail.com. Or you can call me at 561-221-7677. Careful with that phone number. I give it out. I don't care. You call <laughs> me anytime. You know. Okay. Yeah. All right. Well, that's great. Uh, Michael Herbert, thank you so much for joining us today on uh, Recovery Soapbox. And uh, we look forward to paying this message forward and uh, helping as many people as we can together. Thank you, Jonathan, for having me. This has been a great experience. Great. Thanks. All right. That's it for Recovery Soapbox, session 11. We'll see you next time. Thanks, guys. Thanks.